All right, Cubs fam, today I am joined by Alex from Star Wars Explained, and we're going to be talking about our favorite 10 moments from the latest episode of The Mandalorian, The Rescue, Chapter 16. Be ready for some spoilers. Let's go, fam. Go ahead and punch it, Chewie. All right, Alex. How you doing? Thanks for joining us on the channel, man. No problem anytime. I'm doing great. Still riding that high oh, off of dude. that season two finale. It's a good day to be a Star Wars fan. Am I right? <laughs> it really is. It's been a great month. Good couple of weeks with all that news. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so many, so many shows dropping, and obviously the Mandalorian season two. I, do you think season two is better than season one? I think it was for sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, like I liked season one when it was over as a whole. I was like, I get what they were going for. There yeah. were a couple of rocky episodes in the middle for me, sure. but I enjoyed it a lot. The beginning and the end really like made that show for me. Mm. This season, I was like. The, the quality is consistent throughout. Yeah. Even the episodes where I was like, not as good as the rest of the season, I thought were better than the, the lesser episodes of season one. I feel like it just kept getting better, too. I mean, every episode just built and built. The only one I would say is episode one, episode two, maybe went down a little bit. I still liked episode two, but then from three all the way on was just a ride. So here's what we're yeah. going to do today. We already did a video over uh, on Star Wars Explained channel. Go ahead, check that out. I got a link down below in the description. And we rated uh, he, underrated moments from the entire season. Today, we're going to just talk about chapter 16. And the way that we were doing this is we want to call out moments that are maybe less uh, talked about. And so obviously, we love that Luke Skywalker showed up. Um don't be mad at us for not talking about that. So we're, we're going to talk about some different ones. Okay, so you ready to hear my list, Alex? I'm ready. All right, here we go. Number one, I'm showing Ludwig Gorenson on the screen, and I think it's obvious that the music was amazing in this episode and the whole season, but I want to get a little more specific than that. We had the entrance of Luke Skywalker, which is a big entrance, and I love, love, love that he didn't play Luke's theme. He played mm -hmm. a new theme. He didn't rely on old nostalgia to trigger an emotional response. He gave us something completely new. And then when Luke finally takes his hood off, we do hear a little bit of familiar force theme there. But other than that, I just like that he is doing his own thing with it. He's sprinkling in some themes here and there, but nothing major. And I love that. I, I agree. And he did that throughout the season. Mm -hmm. uh, Ahsoka's theme, Yoda's theme were both used for yeah. seconds and yeah. that's it. And and you just move on and it's a nice touch. But yeah, I mean, I think he wants to make his mark on Star Wars and he absolutely has. Uh, and the music in this episode is all over the place in the best way. You got like, yeah, yeah that that new theme for Luke entering. You have the dubstep. The dubstep troopers. The dark troopers, yeah. We'll, so we'll just call them dub troopers from now on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so give him the keys of the kingdom is is all I'm saying. I, I, I am so blown away. And it's funny, I, I don't know if you felt the same way, Alex, but when I first saw the, the first episode of Mandalorian, I wasn't sure what I thought about the music. Same. Yeah. Same. I was like, this is weird, this recorder. Mm -hmm. But man, uh, it, it has immediately, it immediately grew on me back then. Yeah. I mean, I just sometimes when I'm walking my dog, I'm just like, I'm going to listen to the main theme of The Mandalorian for a while because yeah. it's so good. It's really good. It's really good. And you mentioned uh, the the Ahsoka moment. I, I don't know if you know that the, the music is out on iTunes um, mm -hmm. and Apple Music and whatnot. That's a good track to listen to. Uh, that'll... That'll give you some chills. So, all right. Ludwig Gorenson, uh, not relying too much on nostalgia, number one. Number two, the moment that R2-D2 meets uh, Grogu is a cool moment. But what I like about it in particular, Alex, is that Grogu doesn't quite seem ready to leave Din until he sees yeah. R2-D2. How interesting is that? It is very interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I guess just seeing... Like that this this Jedi has another not a child, but yeah. like a, a companion, someone yeah. like R2 is kind of the Grogu to mm. Luke, the this traveling adventurer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think that's kind of what he recognized there. Yeah. And 
Molly, my wife, was saying that she wished that R2 like had a little baby rattler in <laughs> in one of his compartments and that just pops out. Like he has everything else. Why not this too? I you know, it's funny because when he leaned down, I almost thought something like that might happen, but I think he just wanted to get a good look at him. And important to call out, R to my knowledge, R2 Dietz's memory actually was not erased. And Correct. he may know Grogu. They, they they did seem to be communicating. And so that could be just a some kind of trust that's there, or it could be maybe Grogu and R2-D2 have some experience with each other, which I think would be really interesting. It's very possible. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get on to the next one. Number three was this look right here. The look that Moff Gideon gave when, I think it was Bo-Katan who said, it's a Jedi. And then you just see, you get a shot of Mando first, he turns around, he's interested, and then you see Moff Gideon absolutely pooping his pants about the mention of a Jedi. It's, it's something that I, I really like this idea that somebody like Moff Gideon would know who would, what a Jedi is and be scared out of his mind for it. Just to have that name, that title carry that much weight in this moment was really, really good. I think beyond that, I think he knows it's Luke. And mm. I'm just basing that off of his okay. line to Din why don't you just to be safe assume I know everything? Mm. And so I like this idea that, yeah, this ex ISB guy knows who blew up the first Death Star and uh, knows who this Jedi Knight is, who's mm. been around for five years at this point as a yeah. full fledged Jedi Knight. And right. he's like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, here he comes. And, and <laughs> also to see, I think this is a call out you made in your review that I thought, I didn't think about it this way. I thought it was a great call out that the Dark Troopers were there to just absolutely mm. rail the whole crew and it feels like this impossible scenario and then Luke comes in and he's just like, no, no big deal. Absolutely that. And also, uh, we, we've been talking for days now <laughs> about just all these little things that they've pulled in, Bo-Katan, Cobb Vanth, and they pull these things in for a reason. The Dark Troopers are from 1995. Yeah. I thought they were pulling them in because it's just a, a fun thing, a fun yeah. thing for the fans. But no, the dark troopers are there so that Luke could go ham with the force, mm. but it just wouldn't fit who he is. In my opinion, at this point, if it were stormtroopers instead, if he's just cutting heads off and cutting them in half and like throwing them around with yeah. the force, with droids, that works a lot better. We still get to see his power, but he's, it's still, I don't know, violent in a sense, but he's not taking life. Especially after we see, the the fight between Moff Gideon and Mando, which we're going to talk about right here. Moff Gideon's able to, or yeah, Moff, Moff Gideon gets defeated by Mando pretty handily. And right, so Mando's pretty solid at what he does. He's, this guy's well equipped and he got his butt handed to him by a dark trooper. So you really see in a short period of time just how OP uh, these guys are. So let's talk about the fight between uh, Moff Gideon and Mando. I really like, so there's very few moments I can think of in Star Wars history where a lightsaber, is, we're, we're seeing a sword combat with a lightsaber where no force users are involved. The only mm. one I can think about is, uh, is Finn against the Stormtrooper briefly um, in Episode 7. I see only, uh, I'm sure that there's others. Finn, Finn, even though he didn't know it, true. is force sensitive. Okay, so. so maybe, yeah, true. Okay, yeah, so maybe You, you are, that. like... I don't know if that was in their plans at that point or not, but I, I think you could probably say, yeah, Finn versus the Stormtrooper and maybe Finn versus Phasma as well. Yeah. Although that's no lightsaber, though. You're right. Yeah. So it was just, it felt like such a different saber combat. It was so aggressive. Moff Gideon mm -hmm. was just going for it. And I think he knew that Mando was going to need to be taken off guard if he was going to stand a chance. And I, yeah. I also remember reading somewhere uh, that, uh, that, Gene had broken several dark sabers in combat, and after seeing the shot, it makes sense that uh, that that he broke some of the props because he was coming fast. And that that whole fight just felt so messy, so raw, and just really exciting to me. It felt so different than any other lightsaber fight I'd seen. Yeah, you're right. the spear adds this different dynamic that was really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the various ways that Din was using to attack and defend with it, uh, I, I liked that. That it's not just like a okay. We got to have a lightsaber fight. It's like, no, you don't have to. It yeah. can be a dark saber and a spear. Like, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It still packs a similar punch, even, even though it's different. Mm -hmm. All right. 
we're, we're going to get sentimental now. You know, this is this is the tearjerker moment where uh, Din takes his helmet off, which I thought was super tastefully done. But this the moment specifically that, that got me, uh, Alex, was not D- Din's reactions as much as Grogu's reactions. Because Din's been seeing Grogu. He's been seeing him. Grogu's never seen his face. He, it's like seeing his dad's face for the first time. And mm-hmm. when he reaches out and, and touches his face, I just thought it was just this extremely emotional, powerful moment that packed a serious punch. For sure. I don't know that I have anything to add on to that. It was so sweet. Yeah. And it's very much, and I like that Luke is there for that moment of, even though it wasn't a line said, let me look on you with my own eyes. Mm. Like that's, that's what that was. It's so good. Yeah, there, there felt to be some serious parallels there between uh, between that moment on the Death Star and this one on the Imperial Cruiser. So um, good stuff. I, I could talk about that forever, and I think that's a scene I could watch over and over and over and over again. Um, all right, how about this? Little little more uh, tongue-in-cheek, but this scene between Cara Dune and the Imperial officer um, with Dr. Pershing in, you know, in Jeopardy. The conversation they have, Alex, isn't it interesting? It just the, the whole hmm. taunting of Alderaan versus right back at you taunting the Death Star. And it's, yeah. to my knowledge, one of the first times outside of the Battlefront 2 campaign where you really hear an Imperial officer reference the loss of the Death Star in terms of human life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's definitely a, a scene that I think is overlooked in an episode with so much going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's intense, and I was kind of curious. There, there's a look that Din gives Kara at the end of that scene after she shoots the dude, uh-huh. where I was like, "Is she gonna be a problem?" Oh. For the rest of this mission, it didn't really play out that way. But mm-hmm. I think Din was just like looking at her, going like, "Oh dang, she means business." <laughs> <laughs> he, he learned something about her, right? I mean, maybe yeah. he he might have viewed her a little too simplistically up until mm-hmm. now. And and then seeing that uh, that conversation transpire and what happened because of it, I think probably helped him learn a little bit more about her. So yeah, I think you're right. It's very interesting. Okay, I'm I'm glad you liked that moment too. All right, next up, this is uh, let's see here, number seven. I love how just is very simple. I love how much of the interior of the cruiser we get to see. We see so much of it down to this this bridge with the. You know, the stormtrooper can just drop off into hyperspace kind of thing. I just, I love, or not hyperspace, just space. Um, I, I love this, vi- how many visuals we get of this cruiser. It just felt so, so cool and so big. Yes. And that's something I hadn't thought about until right now, which I think is a, a sign of some good set design is that, mm. yeah, you don't really notice it. But in chapter six in season one, The Prisoner, yeah. I was just very cognizant of like they're running around this New Republic ship and it's like it's the same set. They're just using it as a different hallway, quote right. unquote, over and over. And it's like they just built this once and that's fine. Uh, I think season one had some limitations. John Favreau even said something along the lines of like, now that the volume is done, we we have it built and we know how to use it like mm. in season two you're going to get to see more of our budget on screen and i i definitely felt that in season two and and that's a perfect example of it it wasn't like they were running around in the same hallways over and over there were a bunch of different areas of that ship yeah i i'd, I'd like to go count them i didn't but i i'm sure it would be five six seven different different uh areas that they were filming in there which was was really exciting also, you referenced one of my favorite chapters of the whole series, Chapter 6 uh, in Season 1. I know you're, this is just a total tangent here, but I know you're a big Among Us fan. Go watch Chapter <laughs> 6 again, and then picture picture Among Us when you watch that. It's like literally Among Us in Star Wars form. Especially, yeah, with Dennis the <laughs> Imposter picking them all off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, I, well, I rewatched uh, the Season 1 before Episode 2, um, or before uh, uh, Season 2 came out. And that was post Among Us, and I just could not stop thinking about it when I was watching That's that episode. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Number eight is I love not just the fact that Luke Skywalker comes, of course, but I love the way that they progressively reveal it. You, mm. It starts off with, and it's kind of like Boba Fett in, in when they're on Tython. You just see 
Slave One flying off in the distance, just like this, oh, it's Slave One moment. And it's just, I, I don't know what it is about it being that far away that just made it so much more cool and exciting. They did the same thing with Luke with his X-Wing flying off. And then you, you slowly see different parts of him. You see the robe, then you see the glove, then you see the saber. And it's you have to pretty much assume it's Luke with the X-Wing, but you still maybe are questioning, you know, could it be somebody else? Until you see the lightsaber hilt and then it's a dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, I love the way they did that. I, I will admit that there was a split second before I thought Luke where I was like, Carson Tev is here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was excited, but I was like, wait, no, why? Why would he be? Why? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's but, a lot of Jedi that could have come, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> I totally agree that that like slow build up. Um, I'm kind of going back and forth on something mentally on whether or not I, I really liked the way that we got to see the other characters mm. watching what was happening and just kind of oh. getting their take of like, oh, no, like, oh, God, this is is this trouble because they're scared like they don't want to open the doors. A Finnick didn't want anything to do with that. It, right. Yeah. I, I wonder what. It, how that scene would have gone if it were completely shown through those monitors and our heroes watching it. But I'm also like, I mean, I want to selfishly as the fan, I want to see Luke doing that stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad they didn't do that, but I'm, I'm just curious how that scene would have played out. Mm. Just the difference we would have felt. There were a, the, the mood of that room was very, very interesting to observe. I, I think, and I, I think watch it again. Uh, everyone, I've I've seen this episode five times now, um, and I think about what's going on in that room, and not just what's going on with Luke in that moment. And I think I think you'll find some interesting things to to glean on there. So that, that's a good. What call do you out. think? I was gonna. What do you think happened the second he left? Like, I want to know what. Who was the first to say anything? What, what did the they elevator? talk about? Yeah, like he's gone, and Grogu's gone, and it's Bo Katan's just like, what the heck just happened? Like. <laughs> we all just stood there silently and let this man uh take your child and you seem fine with that but like i yeah, want to know their conversation that's a really i i wonder if the conversation just shifts straight to the dark saber i i almost feel like bo katan wouldn't want to talk about it actually knowing her mm -hmm. she's she's probably gonna want to regroup and figure out what to do i don't think she'd fight him for it right then but uh i don't know I'll be, uh, these, this is why I, I had a comment in one of my videos that said they didn't set anything up for the next season. I was thinking, what? Yeah, they did. It's like, I need to know what happens in the next seconds. Not <laughs> <laughs> what is going to happen. But there was also equal resolution, which I thought was really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more. Number eight, and I, I don't think I mentioned these aren't in any particular order. Um, I just love the moment that uh, Bo-Katan and um, is it Koska? Is that her? Yeah, Casca Reeves. Casca. Um, when they recognize Boba as a clone. Um, and mm -hmm. I was actually almost disappointed when she specifically called it out because the acting when he spoke, the second he spoke, you could tell they knew. You could tell they yep. knew this was a clone. And I almost thought it took away from the moment for me as as a super fan when they specifically called it out because I just loved the subtle uh, knowledge that was... That, that was yeah, an excellent reaction from Bo-Katan, but I also really love the line of, I've heard your voice a thousand times. Like, that yeah. was really good. I just got chills saying it. it. But maybe they could have skipped the, you're a clone. Yeah, if it was just, and yeah, because I like yeah. the thousand times line too. And then I, I love how Bo-Katan here, just a, a subtle thought, I love how Bo-Katan in this scene is like kind of start st stoking this fight. Um, mm -hmm. And then it happens and then she lectures them for it happening. I'm like, Bo, you're, you're like pretty much the reason this happened. It was just such a little oh, yeah. Bo-Katan moment uh, where no, she's I, the troublemaker and then she gets it mad at everyone else for the consequences. Yeah. <laughs> I love her so much in this series yeah. and I'm so desperate to see what happens with the dark saber because mm. she has been very like, let's go Mandalorians. We can do this. We can unite and retake our home world, yeah. but it's all under the thought that she is going to be doing the leading. And like, is she really going to be that gung ho if she has to follow someone else? And I really want to know the answer to that. It's easy to take the high road if you're Bo-Katan and talk uh -huh. this nice, soothing story of a unified Mandalore is so much better when it's my mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Can she preach that same rhetoric when it's not her way? 
and exactly when it's, when it's Dinsway. That's I think that's a one of the most interesting setups for the next season. All right, last call out. Now I actually I may need I didn't talk to you about this beforehand. I may need some of your lore expertise on this. Okay. But the Beskar spear lights up and glows red mm -hmm. when the dark saber comes in contact with it. I think that's really interesting. Not just because it was interesting to see it glow red, but because I went back and watched chapter uh, five, or not chapter five, uh, the fifth episode, uh, whatever chapter that was, with uh, Soka yeah. Tano. And when her lightsabers come in contact with the same spear and are there for a little bit, it never glows red. And so mm -hmm. is the dark saber different in that way? Is it more powerful than a regular saber? Yeah, they said that it couldn't cut through pure Beskar, but the the fact that it's heating up, it's glowing red, and it would cool off really quickly, but I don't know. The glowing, to me, makes me think that it could cut mm -hmm. through Beskar eventually. Mm -hmm. it, it would be tough to do in a fight, but I think it could happen. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were throwing around speculation that it would be fun if we found out that... Uh, yeah, regular lightsabers can't cut through Beskar, but a dark saber can. And like, yeah. Din gets his spear out, and it immediately gets cut in half, and you just go like, "Uh oh, he's in trouble." <laughs> but yeah, uh, that didn't play out. No, not quite. But still, it seems to be some kind of weakness. And I think I've always, in the lore at least, felt like the dark saber. The only thing truly significant about it was the story behind it, like Moff Gideon calls mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm. and what it means to Mandalorians, not necessarily that it was a more powerful lightsaber by any stretch, but this makes me think maybe it is in, in some in some ways, because you just don't see Ahsoka sabers have the same effect on this. Yeah. So... All right, those are my 10 items. Uh, go ahead and check out Alex's video down in the comments below. We talked about the whole season in his video. And so I think we had some uh, really, really interesting conversations. Alex, anything you want to add? Anything about this episode that you just want to throw into the video before we finish? Man, I'm still just processing it. I feel yeah. like I, it's one of those where I like, I know that I really like it. And, but it, it also left yeah. me with anxiety about more the future of the series and just what is Grogu going to be okay. And there's so many questions, but it also, like you said, felt like some resolution. I was like, this could have been a series finale. It could and been. so I'm just like, just please tell us what's happening. Like, I'm excited for the Book of Boba Fett, but I, I want to know that I'm going to see uh, my new favorite Mandalorian and his little baby boy again. Yeah, and uh, we talked about this a little bit in your video, but I really, I really feel like the Mandalorian is a story of father and son. It's a story mm -hmm. of an adopted son and an adoptive father. And I feel like that has to be consistent through the whole series in some way. I could be wrong. I just, I, I think we might spend some time away from each other, though. I think we might yeah. see a lot of emphasis on Din and what his role with Mandalore is now and Grogu and what his training is like. But I could see eventually having something happen on one end or the other that inspires them to come back together. Um, so we'll see how that transpires. And I trust that Dave Filoni and John Favreau will have something epic ready for us i i've seen i see i've seen you say this but i've heard a lot of people question you know they, they've got frustrations or everything about what's coming next but listen these guys got it okay they know what yeah. they've done before they know these characters and they've given us two of the best ser seasons of any show i've ever seen some of the best content i've ever seen for star wars i think that they're gonna handle it well totally agreed <laughs> All right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Everyone, if you're not aware of Star Wars Explained, you better be subscribed over there. If you're not subscribed to Star Wars Explained, then you're not a Star Wars fan. So we're going to get out of here. Thank you so much for joining me for the video. And as always, my brothers, don't forget.